You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm so glad you're joining us today. Joining me today is my special guest, award-winning author and screenwriter, Teresa Schwegel. And Teresa's going to be here talking to us about her latest book, The Good Boy. So we're going to be uh, really interested in hearing more about the book and how she came about creating it, as well as all of her other writing and uh, activities, all the wonderful things she has going on. So it's going to be a great episode. Everybody just hang tight. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back after these messages. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well-read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well-informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well-read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try Audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to AudibleDeals.com. That's AudibleDeals.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Joining me now is author Teresa Schwegel talking to us about her new book, The Good Boy. Teresa, welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Congratulations on another successful book. Thank you very much. Yeah, tell uh, our listeners a little bit more about the, the latest book, The Good Boy. The Good Boy is a story about an 11 year old boy who runs away with his father's police canine. Uh, it's from two points of view. So the, the one point of view is the boy, Joel. He's 11, and his father who's looking for him. And uh, his father is uh, not just a typical father, is he? Uh, no, he's a police detective who is in a bit of trouble. Who He'd been protecting a judge prior to the opening of the book and got some bad press. So needless to say, with his son running away with his, his canine, it doesn't, doesn't look good for him. <laughs> and this is not, you know, when we talk about canine dogs, you know, in, in real life, obviously, they're working dogs. They're police officers. They're, this is not just typical boy uh, putting his little uh, lunch in his knapsack and running away with the family dog. No, I don't believe that he thinks that through when he takes off. I was fortunate to be able to work with some canines and learn how those dogs behave. Since I have two dogs of my own, their motivation would be closer to something like bacon. <laughs> for their, their ball, they don't have much ball drive. But um, it was really interesting to see that, and I think it helped tremendously in terms of figuring out how a dog would behave with, with a boy rather than with his, his trainer. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's a lot of dynamics and a lot of dynamics going on in the book as well and this whole storyline. Tell us a little bit about a couple of the characters in there. Uh, I know we mentioned the father and the the son, but what kind of uh, people are they? Well, the boy is on his own for the most part. He has a journey from the north side of Chicago down to the courthouse. It's about six miles. So he has a best friend named Molly in the neighborhood, but his true best friend is Butch the dog. And so his relationship with the dog is really pretty fleshed out over the course of the book. Pete is the dad, I believe I said, and he has a friend who's a bouncer at a local music venue who helps him look for Joel. And so he's not necessarily alone. He also picks up, later in the book, picks up a potential suspect's sister to ride around. She winds up riding around in the back of his canine vehicle while they're looking for the boy. I love the the storyline and all the different dynamics. And I, you know, big kudos to you in the fact that from reading the book, it's you can really relate to each of these characters. You know, though I, I know the boy is a main theme throughout, and the dog, but there's just they all have their own unique characteristics and uh, personalities that come through with the book. Yes, well, thank you. I spent a lot of time trying to differentiate their voices. And I think it was actually most difficult for me to write the boy. When the initial drafts, I noticed that when I went back and read through them, that he was kind of a, a little grown-up. 
And he was really mad about a lot of things that I don't think little kids would be so mad about, like the flavor of his gum. And and I realized that I was just sort of projecting my own grown-up issues (laughs) through the boy. So I had to simplify and and make his journey a little more of an adventure than an adult would perceive it to be. I think most adults and certainly every parent would be mortified by knowing that there is a boy, you know, missing for days and days in a big, big city. Exactly. Well, you know, it, and it is interesting. From a, talk to us a little bit about from a research standpoint, uh, trying to research the characters. I know earlier you talked about spending time with the uh, canine officers, the dogs, to learn a little bit more about that and what they do. How do you actually come up uh, if you don't have a child of your own or a, you know a niece or a nephew or something to pull from? How do you actually get into that mindset? Well, in terms of the family dynamic, that's just something I've always been really interested in, the disconnect to the things that sit in between what people actually say. So that's always been a focus of mine in in writing about relationships, family and personal relationships. In terms of the police stuff, I spend some time, I spend a lot of time over the years with with various police officers, buying them beer, that's one good way (laughs) to, um, to get them to tell me stories. But I think that that, what really interests me is how the job affects officers' personal lives. And so I kind of make that part up. But I think it's, at least for me, it's very honest. And it feels like if a person is doing a job like that in such a heightened reality, that they must take it home with them somehow. Yeah, absolutely. And I I don't think they could help not taking it home. I mean, I know that with all of us who have jobs, whatever our jobs are, we try to separate the work from the family life, but th- there has to be a way that whether we want it to or not for it to bleed over. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I just met with a detective last week and he was telling me about a suicide that he wound up working. And I mean, he he was just really kind of beside himself about the, the situation and the, and the note and everything without really giving you any details. You can imagine that having to deal with something like that and to uh, the fallout, particularly the telling the family and sort of spreading the word and keeping things organized must be must be so difficult to let go of. Yeah, I imagine that it would stay with you for, for a lifetime because uh, yeah. I'm sure it's not his first situation he's dealt with in right. that capacity. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, big kudos to them. I think we'll stick to writing. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Well, tell us a little bit about then, this is your, your fourth novel, correct? No, my fifth novel. Fifth novel. So yeah. uh, stand corrected. So this is your fifth novel. So this whole process, when you get your first one out there and you had such a you know great success with your Edgar Award winning book, Officer Down, and then you've got to do follow-ups from that and you're trying to come up with new characters, new ideas. How does that process work for an author? How do you go about keeping it fresh and keeping a new idea going? I can't speak for any other authors. It's a long process for me. I, I don't want to repeat myself, and I and I need to find something that I feel fairly strongly about. And so I think I tend to start from some sort of vague theme and work forward from there. And it comes from finding the right character to put in the right situation to reflect that theme. I think it's Michael Connolly who's credited with saying that it's not how the cop works the case, it's how the case works on the cop. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that that's very interesting to me, is, as I mentioned, officers' personal lives and personal relationships being of most interest. But having said that, I'm terrible at plot. So that usually is something that I have to try to, that engine is something that I have to find after I have the car detailed, pretty much. <laughs> And that's when the police officers I know are very helpful. There's always one or two stories that stick with me that I feel are appropriate to tell within the space of the novel in terms of a crime happening, which, of course, is is the key to writing crime fiction. (laughs) Hopefully there will be a crime. And so that's generally how I start. Now, when I started, my background was in screenwriting. I was in film school school getting my graduate degree for, for that. And so I came at the the process from that structural standpoint, which is really helpful to me because in screenwriting, it's it's very boilerplate. You need certain things to happen to keep the action moving. Every scene has to have some progress. With a novel, you get to dawdle a little bit more, which is kind of a relief for me because that's the part that I'm better at, I think. So I want to talk a little bit more about that also. So let's go ahead and go to a uh, commercial break real quick, and then we'll come back and talk to you a little bit about the comparisons between uh, writing novels and screenwriting as well as a bunch of other things. So everybody just hang tight. We're going to continue our conversation with uh, Teresa Schweigel, talk to her a little bit more about her book, The Good Boy, right after these messages. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. 
Pause up. I'm Arden Moore, and I'm here to tell you about a revolutionary new product that literally swipes away cat hair from virtually any surface. You know, most of us struggle with a roller or vacuum cleaner to clean up cat hair, but anyone who has tried either of these knows they just don't work very well. But Swipe It's patent pending glove has a magnetic-like quality that removes cat hair from almost everything. Right, Ziki? Right, Murphy? And best of all, Swipe It's is machine washable, so you can use it over and over again. To order, just visit SwipeIt's.com. That's S-W-I-P-E-T-S. A simple solution for shedding. Petco, where the pets go. Petco, where the pets go. Pet Life Radio has tail wagging, fur flying, fabulous deals for our listeners from Petco. Get six dollars off your order of sixty dollars or more, and up to forty percent off the entire Petco site. That's right. But that's not all. Because you're a Pet Life Radio listener, you'll also get free shipping on your order of forty nine dollars or more. Six dollars off, up to forty percent off, and free shipping. From Pet Life Radio and Petco. To get these awesome deals, go to PetcoDeals.com. That's PetcoDeals.com. Petco, where the pets go. Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Werber from Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff here on Pet Life Radio. We want to hear from you. Listen in. We're on every Thursday, 1 o'clock Pacific Time, 4 o'clock Eastern Time here on PetLifeRadio.com. We are one of the only live shows on Pet Life Radio, and I'm here to answer your questions. So you can call in at 877-385-8882, or you can drop me an email to drjeff at petliferadio.com, and hopefully we'll see you here on Thursdays. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is Tim Link, your host, and I'm here with uh, author Teresa Schwegel. And uh, Teresa, we've been talking a little bit about your book, The Good Boy. And at the last commercial break, you had mentioned that you were uh, doing getting your MFA in screenwriting and the comparisons between the two. Do you find one process easier than the other, or does, is it a building block when you're trying to do the templates and, and the boilerplates for screenwriting compared to putting together a novel? I think they're very different. But having said that, I think the thing that's necessary is to be able to write visually. In terms of a screenplay, you're trying to spell out what everybody else is supposed to do. You get people to get the director to see the scene and get the actors to see where they are and and determine how they're supposed to behave. And with with a novel, you're trying to get the reader to do that same thing. So while screenplays are a bit, as I said, a bit more boilerplate, novels, it's the writer's job to get the reader to see what you see. Yeah, so the process, I guess it's, uh, I wouldn't, would you correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, one's not harder necessarily than the other. It's just, it's a totally different mindset when you're working with the two different uh, medias. Yes, yes, I think so. I also think that when you're, when you're talking about screenwriting, you're writing with the screen in mind. And so things are a little bit heightened. You have to spell things out with screenwriting. You can't go for the subtle approach because it's just not going to come off the page. Right, so it's got to jump out at you because you're, you're really, uh, it's, to me at least when I'm looking at it, and I'm not a screenwriter by any means, but the visual part of it, it's sort of like telling someone the time, looking at the watch itself compared to a novel where you have to actually get into the gears and the bolts and all the things that are inside of it. Right, and you also always want to stay away from having some scene where an actor's talking to himself in the mirror or something like that. You don't get the opportunity to have any inner dialogue, at least not any of the the good films I've seen. <laughs> and with the novel, you get you have the whole you know course of the book to be able to explore those those inner workings. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So talk to us a little bit about crime fiction. How did that all come about? I mean, is it part of your life? And you grew up in Chicago, where this book, uh, The Good Boys, based out of. Did you pull from your Chicago roots? How did all that come about? I did certainly. I think that I I try to make Chicago one of my characters in each book. Having said that, I have no police experience or crime background, nothing more than a speeding ticket, and that was a long time ago. So I think it comes from essentially my interest in in telling personal stories and then needing some sort of backdrop, as I said before, some sort of engine so that that there would be a story where things are happening (laughs) rather than just, you know, that, that character looking in the mirror thinking about things. So 
I did have, growing up, did have a, my second parents, I'll call them. My second mom was a paramedic, and so she had a a scanner in her house running 24-7. And I do remember growing up hearing all of that, all the radio chatter. And that was always exciting to me because there would be a certain tone that would go off on the on the scanner and she would run out of the house to go be a hero. And so so maybe that part of it stuck with me. But honestly, I didn't have any intention of getting into, into crime writing, per se. I just started to tell a story about a, a woman who was dating a married man and they both happened to be police. <laughs> After my first book was published, that's sort of what people wanted, that they wanted more Chicago police stories. Wow. Interesting how that dynamic comes about. Because uh, like you said, it, it wasn't anything planned. It wasn't like you woke up one day and said, hey, I want to do uh, you know, crime fiction based most of it in Chicago since that's where I'm from. Yeah, no, I had no idea that that would happen. In fact, I, I don't think even today I couldn't have predicted that I would write more than one book like that because I didn't know anything about police work. It's, and one of my favorite stories is that after the the book was finally published, my publisher, St. Martin's Press, there was a rumor going around that I was actually a police officer. Uh-huh. If you had read early drafts of that book, you would have said, clearly, she has no idea what she's <laughs> talking about. But I found some police who were interested in helping me and thank, bless them all because I don't know where I'd be without them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow, that's fascinating. So then let's talk about uh, directions moving forward. Obviously, the readers are expecting you know, a good crime fiction book, a good crime novel. But has there been any inkling in your writer's pocket to uh, diversify from that and do something totally different? Well, I don't know. Taking the financial of aspects of it, of course, and making sure St. Martin doesn't have a heart attack when you tell them. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I, have, I have one more book to write for them right now, and that's going to be – Another Chicago police story about elder abuse and financial exploitation. That's something that's been of interest to me as of late. And now I'm actually toying with whether or not I should give the detective a dog because everybody seems very um, excited about the way that I wrote Butch. And honestly, having two dogs, they served as my inspiration. And so I loved writing about them. It was so natural for me to do that. It was natural to include include them. And, and if any of my family and friends or my husband has read the book, say, oh, I, I recognize Wiley in that part. I recognize Winnie in that part. <laughs> so, you know, I, I would love to try to figure out a way to do that. But but I, am, I haven't written a series. Uh, my only through line with all of these books is, has been the city. So, so I think that that's something I'd definitely like to stick to. And if I could find another way to get stories to move, I might branch out from from crime fiction, but I really do think it's a great way to tell a story, and I, you know, I don't know where I would go from there. I mean, I'm certainly not looking to write a literary novel or a romance, or you know, given my other options, I think that crime suits me. Right, right. Stick with what you're great at, and you do a great job with it. So I, I would say just stick with it. It's good, and always put a dog or a cat or some critter in there. That's <laughs> what we always say. Yeah. <laughs> So we've got two important questions to ask, um, okay. definitely before we wrap up. Uh, one is, uh, what kind of dogs do you have? Oh, of course. I have a Ridgeback Lab. His mm. name is Wiley. And an Australian cattle dog mix. Her name is Winnie. And so we say that they're the yin and the yang because I'm not sure which one's yin, but Winnie, the cattle dog, is, is very neurotic and high-strung and is afraid of thunder and likes things a certain way. And Wiley, probably the lab part of Wiley, just wants to eat and hang out and <laughs> snuggle. So they're great dogs. They're both nine years old, and um, they're trained very well. My husband trained them when they were puppies, took them out into the woods for a few weeks. And so even living in the city, we rarely have them on leash. They're just very obedient and, and wonderful dogs. Wow, that's great. That sounds like you got a nice counterbalance there. And, uh, I do. Yeah, so the big question is, does it match for you and your husband? A lot of times uh, the dogs, especially if you have two in the household, one will sort of mirror the other one. I think at times probably we trade off. That's been a lot day it is. Yeah. Okay, and then that leads my, to the next important question. Are you a Cubs fan or a Sox fan? Oh, I'm a Cubs fan. Oh, boy. You bet. Is this their year? I No. No. <laughs> well, you're no. realistic, man. <laughs> I, re- I do remember my grandmother saying that she hoped that they would take the series in, in my dad's lifetime because my she was born short, like a month after they won the series in 1908, I think, 1907. Right, right, right. Yeah, but, you know, we're still waiting. We're still, <laughs> so, still waiting. Meanwhile, I think still- I think it has a lot to do, however, I think it was where you grow up. I think if you're a South Sider, you go Sox, and if you're a North Sider, you go with the Cubs, and so that's you know, 
had to keep it keep it in the keep it with the family. There you tradition. go. There's always next year anyway. That was the most important question on an animal rights show. <laughs> that's a personal question. That's my. Uh, <laughs> I, I uh, many years of playing uh, semi-pro baseball, so oh, uh, I see my futility in baseball. So I, that was my question, and I will say the coldest summer I ever spent was a day at Wrigley Field. So uh, I will say that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's known to happen. <laughs> yeah, it was freezing cold in the middle of August, and then we went down to the South Side catch the Sox game, and it was uh, hot. You know, we had to take our sweatshirts and stuff off. So mm-hmm. the wonderful nuances of Chicago, but as long as there's deep dish pizza and uh, Chicago dogs, you're in good shape. That's true. So after our readers pick up a copy of the book, The Good Boy, and read it, what do you hope uh, they walk away with? What would be uh, one or two little bits that they you hope they get out of it? Little bits. Well, I think as I've been going around speaking to different libraries and bookstores and readers, I think the message I really want to make clear is that to listen to your kids. I think there are a lot of people who do what I did when I started to write, and that's treat treat our kids like little grown-ups. And, um, and I think given, you know, all the issues that the kids face these days is bullying and cyberbullying and everything else. But it's important to to really engage with them. And that's obviously what Pete does not do in the book. Exactly. Yeah. They grow up too fast now anyway. Yeah. Yeah, we should, uh, we definitely should treat them uh, like kids uh, as long as we can. So that's a good message. That's a very interesting comment. So I, I like that because uh, when I'm talking to a, an author that writes crime fiction, I wouldn't expect the you take. You wouldn't think, right? <laughs> uh, kudos to some deep stuff there. And that's, that's very true to, to form. So definitely a great takeaway. Thank you. So how can uh, our listeners find out more about you and the book, The Good Boy, and all the wonderful things you got going on? Well, they can visit my website, which is www.teresaschwagel.com, and they can find me on my Facebook fan page, which is Teresa Schwagel Author. They can also hit up the Macmillan site for more general information about the other books that are there available. And how else? I think the, that's about it. Send me an email. I love responding to emails. I love hearing from readers, so I'd be happy to see you there. Fantastic. So everybody, uh, take a look at that. Take a look at all the sites, all the wonderful books. Definitely pick up a copy of the latest book, The Good Boy by Teresa Schwagel. Teresa, thanks so much for coming on the Animal Rights Show and Pet Life Radio. It was a joy talking to you. Continued uh, great success into the future. Well, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Well, we're uh, coming to the end of the show today, so I want to thank everyone for listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Thank you to our sponsors and producers for making this show possible. To find out more about me, Tim Link, and the other guests I've interviewed on the Animal Rights Show, you can go to PetLifeRadio.com. It's PetLifeRadio.com. Click on the Animal Rights icon and download the episodes. And while you're there, check out all the other wonderful hosts and shows on Pet Life Radio. If you have any questions, comments about the show, or any ideas that you have for the show, please send me an email. You can email me at Tim at PetLifeRadio.com. It's Tim at PetLifeRadio.com. Be glad to uh, answer your questions and listen to your comments and bring on the people you want to hear most onto the show. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life. Share it in a blog, an article, or in a book. And who knows, you may be the next guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.